So I've been playing a lot of Animal Crossing's New Horizons lately. I mean, judging by my Twitter feed, so has pretty much everyone else. In these times of lockdown, quarantine and shelter in place, for a lot of people, I think Animal Crossing's been a real lifeline. The game is pretty much unabashed escapism, an escapism of the sort which dovetails almost perfectly with the present moment. For one, a lot of us are currently spending a considerable amount of time indoors, and this is a game in which you are mostly outside among nature. A more profound take on the game's popularity was offered up by Rob Hyrett, a Nintendo employee who worked on localising the game into English a couple of weeks back. He quoted early reviews of the game which joked that, where previous games in the Animal Crossing series had made you the mayor of your town, this one, in giving you the ability to terraform the very landscape, makes you God. And he suggested that, in the time of COVID-19, we don't need to be gods, we just need agency. We need a comfortable bed where we can arrange the blankets just how we like them. That feels like the most significant part of the game's popularity to me. At a time when we seem to be caught in a kind of epidemiological riptide with little control over our lives, indeed with many of the basic freedoms we usually enjoy having been taken away, such as having a haircut, Animal Crossing is a sandbox in which we can reclaim a semblance of power. It is my solemn duty to inform you then that Animal Crossing is in fact a thinly veiled parable for the functioning of contemporary neoliberal economics. Okay, not quite, but there's a couple of mechanics within the game that open up some interesting discussions about our present economic system. And I don't just mean the way in which Tom Nook has gained a perfect, vertically aligned monopoly on all economic activity on your island, other than, I guess, maybe the Able Sister shop, although even only they are able to establish a presence on the island due to their acquaintance or maybe even friendship with Timmy and Tommy, so maybe that does have something to say about what Pierre Bourdieu refers to as social capital. But no, we're not going to talk about Tom Nook and landlordism or monopolies or anarcho-capitalism, I feel like pretty much everything there is to be said about that has already been said. In fact, the game itself kind of makes fun of the eerie combination of Nook's personable demeanour and complete economic dominance over both your life and the entirety of the in-game world at a few points in a way that somehow makes it more dystopian. So yes, obviously, hashtag nationalised Nooking. But I think there's a slightly more nuanced point to make about the political economy of Animal Crossing, and this doesn't relate to Tom Nook, but to turnips and the stork market. And not only in the mere existence of the stork market, but the way in which the game increasingly encourages you to move beyond the mundane, only mildly profitable practice of extracting resources, sometimes perhaps fashioning them into usable goods, and then selling them to Timmy and Tommy to presumably sell on to someone else, and instead to make your fortune through betting on whether the magic turnip number will go up. Because who wants to waste their time and energy engaging in the economy in a productive, if potentially ecologically devastating way, when you can basically win money from doing nothing at all? Now, the stock market seems to me to be a fairly intentional parody of how meaningless the trading of stocks and shares often seems from the outside. Yet, yeah, the way in which, when playing, one likely finds themselves relying more and more on this mystical market to make money mirrors a real-world phenomenon known as financialization, which has similarly seen economic activity in advanced capitalist nations such as the UK and US become increasingly less centred on productive activity, such as the selling of goods and services, and instead on the financial sector, banking and speculation. In order to discuss all of this, however, we first need to talk about interest rates. Gripping stuff, I know. On the 23rd of April 2020, Animal Crossing players received a letter from the Bank of Nook, the game's in-game bank, notifying them that interest rates on their savings were to be slashed from an already pretty paltry 0.5% to just 0.05%. Some fans theorised that this was an attempt to discourage players from exploiting the ability to change the Switch console's onboard clock to time travel forward a year or so to reap the rewards of their savings early. Even for those who'd stuck to the rules, Ethan Gack of Kotaku wondered whether it might more broadly be a way of ensuring that players couldn't simply amass a certain amount of money in their Bank of Nook account and then live off the interest. Either way, it seemed intended to ensure that players still had to do something 
in the game to increase the amount of bells they had available to spend. It wasn't only games websites such as Kotaku who reported on this story, however. The Bank of Nook slashing of interest rates also caught the attention of publications such as the Financial Times, which went as far as to feature the story on its front page. Each of these outlets pointed to the way in which the in-game interest rate cut mirrored similar cuts to interest rates then being made by real-world central banks. During March 2020, for instance, the Bank of England cut interest rates for the UK twice, first to 0.25% and then to just 0.1%. Other central banks have done similarly, and the goal of doing so is pretty much the same as that which seems to have been behind Nintendo's decision. It's an attempt to get people to stop hoarding whatever amount of money they might have in their savings, and to instead get out, spend it, and grease the wheels of the local, national, and global economy. It also, to the same end, usually makes the cost of borrowing money cheaper so that even if you don't have a bulging savings account, you can still do your bit by taking on debt. See, the COVID-19 pandemic and the lockdown, quarantine, and shelter-in-place measures put in place to combat it have been devastating for many economies. At a very basic level, if people are trapped in their houses, then they can't go out and spend money. Even after these measures end, people are likely to still be fairly hesitant to spend too much. In an uncertain economic climate, many people's instinct is to cling tightly to any spare money they might have after covering their basic costs in case things get worse. Now, I want to begin by saying that other economic systems are available, ones in which the poorest and most disempowered in our society wouldn't find themselves at risk of insolvency or homelessness due to circumstances so obviously beyond their control. However, the system we presently live in requires people to be spending money in order to properly function. Under capitalism, your job, however close or distant it might seem from sales, is reliant on people buying stuff. I mean. I make free videos for the internet, but the fact that people are being hesitant to part with their cash at the moment means that advertisers are being more cautious with how they spend their money, which means that the amount that comes into my bank account from these videos at the end of each month is substantially lower. Thank you, of course, to the amazing people who support me on Patreon for providing some kind of stability amidst all of this. Reducing interest rates in both Animal Crossing and the real world, then, is essentially a mechanism for encouraging people not to save, but to get out and spend. In the real world, we've also seen a number of other mechanisms put in place, with massive, some might say unprecedented, <laughs> amounts of money being made available to businesses and corporations through stimulus packages such as that included in the United States' CARES Act. The aim here is fairly similar. Dishing out money to businesses is an attempt to ensure that they can continue to cover their present costs, including paying staff, and in an ideal world, to ensure they've got money on hand to invest into further innovating into whatever industry it is that they're a part of in order to be able to introduce new products and services to the market, which in turn will further stimulate the economy and help us to rise out of the oncoming recession. If you've been playing Animal Crossing, however, you might not be so sure that this will be the case. For since the Bank of Nook cut interest rates, I can't imagine many of those who have managed to amass a great fortune in the game have returned to simply buying and selling furniture, or catching and selling bugs and fish to keep their stacks of bells increasing. Instead, if they've got any sense at all, they'll be firing up their switches at some point before midday on a Sunday, taking their money out the bank and investing it in turnips. Buying turnips and speculating on the stock market is certainly a far riskier endeavour than either keeping your bells in the bank or buying and selling goods, but the potential returns that one can gain from doing so are exponentially higher. Even if you were to lose out one week, you can probably still make back your losses fairly quickly. In short, within Animal Crossing, you'd be a mug to use your enforced financial liquidity to participate in what economists refer to as the real economy, the bit of the economy in which goods and services are bought and sold. After a certain point, the game heavily encourages you to find your path to wealth in its equivalents of the financial sector. Now, I don't think it all that likely that many sort of ordinary people will do the same in real life. Yet, there is a strong chance that those companies presently receiving corporate bailouts, a further method that governments are presently using to get the economy moving, 
might. The analogy doesn't map on perfectly. It's not necessarily the case that companies will use the money they've been given by governments to buy stocks and shares in other companies, although they might. What seems highly possible, however, is that unless they are strictly barred from doing so, companies will use their new liquidity not to avoid job losses or to invest in the future, but to boost their own stock prices. Of course, these two things don't have to be in conflict with one another. Traditionally, a company's share price is meant to be a reflection of the profitability of that company. And making a company more profitable, especially in the long term, often does involve taking some of the additional money that that company has lying around and reinvesting it to increase capacity through hiring more staff maybe, or engaging in research and development to create new products and services, which that company can then sell in the future. Something which also, perhaps, often involves hiring more staff or otherwise contracting other businesses to build new facilities. In recent decades, however, many corporations have increasingly put the cart before the horse, or the turnips before the raccoon dog, the turnips being a metaphor for stocks and Tom Nook a metaphor for profit. In short, they come to focus on short-term increases in their stock price, often at the direct expense of long-term profitability. In a 2000 article for the journal Economy and Society, William Lozonic and Mary O'Sullivan posited that there had been a shift in corporate governance from retain and reinvest to downsize and distribute. Companies have, of course, always sought to keep their costs low to increase their profit margin. But since the 1970s, we've seen a massive shift towards companies slimming down their operations, even when that might damage long-term profitability in order to provide short-term gains for their shareholders. This is one consequence of a far broader economic trend known as financialization. Jared Epstein defines financialization as the increasing role of financial motives, financial markets, financial actors, and financial institutions in the operation of the domestic and international economies. It refers to a wide trend in which financial activity, that's trading in stocks, shares, securities, and other similar products, has come to dominate the global economy, often at the direct expense of the real economy. A great and accessible exposition of how all this came to be can be found in Grace Blakely's book, Stolen, How to Save the World from Financialization. Of course, there's much that's wrong about the way in which our real economy works too. Even those companies that do continue to retain and reinvest habitually seek to pay their workers less than the value of their labor. Nevertheless, when a company participates in a meaningful way in the real economy, they're at least making their money through creating, or facilitating their workers' creation of some kind of tangible value for society through creating new products and services. The financial sector, by contrast, makes money through increases in the perceived value of things. Take landlords, for instance. <coughs> Unless they undertake a significant renovation of the property that they own, when a landlord increases the rent on a house, They've not made money through actually creating something new in the world, they've simply made money through the increased perceived value of that property. To go back to Animal Crossing, when you catch a fish or chop down trees and sell those to Timmy and Tommy, you have made money through contributing new resources to the market which were not there previously. If you were to make and sell the hot item of the day, then even better, you've provided a new product for someone, somewhere, to use. When you make money through an increase in the perceived value of turnips, however, you've had little real impact on the island around you. So why do we keep bailing these companies out? Why, for instance, did Tesco, the largest supermarket chain in the United Kingdom, receive a tax break worth £585 million just prior to it paying out £635 million to its shareholders in order to stop its share price from falling? Well, that's because in the real world, financial markets are not entirely disconnected from the real economy. In Animal Crossing, Timmy never stands to lose his job because of a crash in the price of turnips. Yet, however much they downsize, however little they innovate, and however much they try to suppress wages, large corporations in the real world are still massive employers. Our present economic system thus needs them to stay afloat. They are, as the phrase goes, too big to fail. 
What Grace Blakely refers to as the financialization of the corporation is in fact one of the reasons that so many large companies have found themselves in such dire straits during the present crisis. For any money that a company keeps held back in case of a rainy day is money that company is not distributing to its shareholders in dividends and thus pushing its share price up even higher. Some might argue that these companies also know how reliant the economies in which they operate are on their continued existence and so perhaps don't see the need to have reserves as they know that governments are unlikely to let them go bankrupt. In the wake of the 2008 financial crisis, the economist Nouriel Roubini coined the term socialism for the rich, writing in an article for The Guardian that our present system operates in such a way that profits are privatised and losses are socialised. In short, in the good years and as we're seeing at the moment, even sometimes in the bad, the profits made within our economy are quickly siphoned off to shareholders. When things turn sour, however, these same companies come crawling on their hands and knees to governments and central banks, expecting to have their losses covered for them. Even when things are going well, so desperate are governments to keep large corporations operating within their jurisdictions or to encourage them to move to them that they will often provide tax breaks and other incentives to subsidised companies' future investments. This has a pretty clear parallel in Animal Crossing. Oh, you want Nooking to build new housing which it will profit from the sale of? Well, we're going to need the taxpayer to contribute to that. If not, we'll probably leave it. The question remains then, if we're happy to socialise the losses, why not also socialise the profits too? If we're to front Tom Nook the cost of building the house, why not hashtag nationalise Nook Inc and benefit from the proceeds of the sale of the house and not in his proprietary Nook Miles currency but in actual real bells? Well, not real bells, obviously, but sort of real within the context of the game. And similarly, why not hashtag nationalise Tesco or hashtag nationalise Virgin Atlantic or hashtag nationalise any of the other companies who expect us to cover the cost of their failures? For in doing so, we might not only be able to stop this redistribution of wealth from ordinary taxpayers to the super rich, but also to rebuild our economy so that it works in the way that we're often led to believe it does in a way which includes innovation and investment, in a way that is centred around the creation, buying and selling of goods and services, not merely in trying to push the magic turnip number up and up exponentially in a way that actively detriments the lives of ordinary working people. Thank you very much for watching this video. Uh, if you found it interesting, please do consider uh, sharing it with an Animal Crossing loving friend. Uh, thanks as always to Ash, to Michael V. Brown, to J. Fraser Cartwright, to Army of Me, to Sintry Nielsen, and to Kaya Lau for being signed up to the top tier of my Patreon. If you'd like to join them in supporting what I do here, then uh, I would be super grateful, and you can do so at patreon.com forward slash Tom Nicholas. Thanks once again for watching, and have a great week.